It's good to be back at Idea City. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. Uh, I have a long-standing engagement in England and just couldn't uh, change plans, but I'm glad to be there even in this uh, slightly artificial way. In general, I think the greater the range of information sources available, the better. It is dangerous if public opinion formation is concentrated in a few hands. This reaches an extreme stage in the infamous case of someone like Dr. Goebbels. A much milder case occurred when all the national information sources were in a few hands in large democracies, such as the BBC and three or four newspaper owners in Britain, or the three broadcasting networks and about six or seven newspaper and magazine owners in the United States. In the unlimited multiplicity of choices we have now, no one can possibly be in control of making public opinion generally for a whole population of a sophisticated democracy. What has occurred is essentially a trade-off. Infinite choice of information sources and the evaporation of any limits to content. The highest quality analysis of any issue is generally available, but so are the kooks, the defamers, the coarse, and the hateful. In an advanced society, such a range of information sources can generally be relied upon to assist the majority in maintaining sensible views on public policy questions. But it also assures that there will be a larger number of audible quacks and credulous people to fall under their influence. Most recent terrorist incidents in democratic countries have been committed by people influenced or assisted in their actions by internet bad actors. It is hard not to be concerned about the extent of security surveillance and commercially minded information gathering that have become increasing subjects of controversy. I have always taken the position that 99% of security information gathering is useless and innocuous, and I do not object in principle to businesses making the most of their franchises. I assume that those who really are trying to evade detection because of illegal or ultra-sensitive activities will design their affairs around increasingly sophisticated surveillance. But intrusion is offensive beyond a certain point and should be monitored by a responsible and nonpartisan agency answerable to legislators as a whole and not just to any particular government or administration. People are generally entitled to a reasonable amount of privacy and working out a framework that accommodates that fact without impairing public security will be a challenge. But all democratic societies will have to try to do it, and in most of them the public will demand no less. This immense choice of media sources also leads to some trend-setting demarcations of influence between the media and in the career paths of public leaders. In the United States, in the era of Franklin D. Roosevelt, most of the major publishers opposed the president, but most of the working journalists admired him and were susceptible to his overpowering personal charm and eloquence. He rarely received a majority of editorial endorsements, but was generally sympathetically covered in news stories and was the most successful politician in the history of serious democracies with two victories as governor of New York and four as president of the United States, carrying legislative majorities in behind them for 16 consecutive years. According to the authoritative Pew Research and Harvard Media Center, 90% of national media coverage is hostile to President Trump. This impasse between the president and most of the traditional media has doubtless been aggravated by Trump's pioneering tactic of going around the media and addressing the country on Twitter. Twitter is often described as a leftist enterprise in its selection of people to bar from access to it. But it is unthinkable that Twitter would try to intercept or censor the traffic of the president. And the president's media advisors believe that when he tweets, he connects at once with up to 70 million people, and that within 10 minutes they've tweeted on to another 70 million. Such swift exposure to more than half the adult population of the United States 
confers immense influence directly on the president and must be assumed the principal reason that the media onslaught against President Trump has never driven his registered support in polls down to the point where he might appear vulnerable to an impeachment charge by his enemies. This president is so controversial, his opponents would probably try to impeach him even if there were no legal cause, to try to turn impeachment and removal from office into what in the parliamentary system is just a non-confidence vote, not a conviction of high crimes and misdemeanors. The president also enjoys, as he did as a candidate, fairly solid support from the large audience talk shows. If his exposure to voters via social media and talk show radio are measured accurately, they seem at least to balance the hostility to him of the traditional national television networks, most of the cable television, CNN and MSNBC, and printed media. This has come in two stages, a cracking open of what even in the United States was something of a media cartel, about 15 media companies. It may have operated commercially as an informal cartel, though there was a great deal of competition within it, but it certainly never locked arms and tried to impose its will on the entire electorate. The first stage in cracking this system apart was Rupert Murdoch's assault on the triopoly of the American National and Columbia Broadcasting Networks by buying a bunch of independent stations, calling them the Fox Network, putting them on cable, and founding the Fox News Network to occupy a conservative market niche that proved to suit almost half the people. When Rupert Murdoch outlined his plan to Roger Ailes, one of the famous exchanges in media business history occurred. That could work if you start now, said Ailes. How much will it cost? asked Murdoch. Eight hundred million dollars. What are you waiting for? It was an astounding success and seems to have durably shifted the balance and enhanced the variety of media political opinion. Murdoch also advanced the cause of media integration, using his film studio to produce television programming and cross-promoting his outlets to some extent. Cable and satellite television proliferated. The second stage, obviously, came with the internet and social media, and when the internet achieved a clarity of picture equivalent to television, there was an unlimited number of outlets and channels. Not even aggressive channel surfing would begin to cover the range of information and entertainment that is available to people who know their way around the new media. I don't see any reason to regret this fragmentation of formerly very powerful franchises. The power to influence opinion is very widely dispersed and elitism is the loser, almost always a good thing. Genuine talent will thrive no matter how competitive the environment, and election campaigns not only become much more complicated and expensive, old-fashioned demagogues and scoundrels have a much more difficult time competing for the public's attention and credence than they did when someone like Hitler was the only such voice and radio the main medium. Presumably, in even a primitive democracy today, such as Pakistan, it would also be impossible to engage in the level of physical intimidation that Hitler did as a party leader who commanded a large and nationwide gang of uniformed street bullies. In the prolonged era when the media, the working press, and fourth estate provided almost all the news and comment from a finite variety of sources, journalism was presented as a craft and was favored with degree-bearing status as an academic discipline. The journalist longed the avocational gathering place of adventurers of the most varied descriptions, from banal to exotic, claims to be not only a craft but also a semi-learned profession. This is no truer in the digital age than it was before. There are and always have been journalists who act with great professionalism, meaning thoroughness, impartiality, integrity, and presentational elegance. But as long as they know the language they perform in and use it well, and are as technically competent as their branch of journalism requires, that is all they need. Admission to and success in journalism is more a matter of experience than of academic study. The crisis of journalism and its impact on public policy and institutions in the digital age is that the political leaders can be reduced to intermediaries, as Donald Trump has done. 
The radio enabled political leaders to speak directly to the people. Hitler and Roosevelt were the first prominent leaders to do so successfully, but Winston Churchill and Charles de Gaulle, speaking at night to occupied France, listening clandestinely, followed. All France welcomed de Gaulle at the liberation, having no idea of his appearance, but an intimate knowledge of his voice. John F. Kennedy, Richard Nixon, and especially Ronald Reagan exploited television. And now, while millions of people grumble about the president's tweets, President Trump has developed a direct line to the people on Twitter, amplified by his talk show followers. And he uses his office to be continually before and in the face of his electors, whether they like him or not. He attacked the entire political system, including the national political media, and so far he has succeeded. He relentlessly pans the partisanship and dishonesty of his media opponents and currently enjoys from two to three times as great an approval rating from the public as the media does. I am not worried about the decline in the media's prestige. It is well-deserved and the best possible incentive for them to raise their standards. First of all, in separating opinion from comment. This traditional criterion of media performance has been allowed to lapse almost everywhere. If Donald Trump is instrumental in raising the standards of American journalistic integrity, it will be one of his greatest achievements. Thank you very much and a happy Idea City to all of you.